And uh, right, so so where are we? Um, I'm trying to find this thing called the Morse complex, which is also sometimes called the Morse, maybe more properly called the Morse snail complex. And maybe just the his bit of history that I, I, I probably haven't mentioned the name snail enough in my talk. Um, I think the whole idea of not just thinking about the function, but also the gradient like vector field, and then using that to get handle decompositions, that is not really Morse's like, original idea. And I think that more often goes that's snail's addition to it. And the idea of having um, like sending and descending manifolds intersect transversely and so on, that's really snail. So, um, anyway, but I, I probably forget again to give snail as due credit. Um, so, but, um, so let me remind you what it is and then try to motivate it again. I, I, again, I talked about it in a kind of wishy washy way on Friday before spring break, and I'll try to be much more rigorous today. Um, and, and I wanted to add one, so so we're, we're giving, giving a uh, um, uh, manifold x. Let's keep things simple and so it's a closed n manifold. And the Morse function f from x to r with a gradient like vector field. Um, let's assume that it is, um, uh, I, can't, I think I said order, like index order, which means that um, critical points, critical values of index i are less, are less than critical values of index i plus 1, um, which we know we can always achieve. That just makes everything a lot easier to talk about. I don't think it's absolutely necessary for this, but just make that, and then again, as setting, this is my cryptic um, notation. All ascending and descending manifolds intersect transversely in intermediate regular level sets. Um, and this is sometimes called, so sometimes when you say a gradient like vector field with this property, that's called a snail. Well, the whole the whole package then would be called a more snail setup or something. That, or you say the Morse function with a snail flow or something like that. But again, this 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 transversality and this gradient like vector field is sort of snail's thing. Um, then I'm going to define a sequence of abelian groups, of free abelian groups, and a sequence of maps between them, uh, um, group homomorphisms between them. And so we define uh, C sub i to be the free abelian group generated by critical points of index i. Okay, so they have one for each i between 0 and n. And then we define, I, I think I will uh, use a subscript um, on the boundary maps. This is called the boundary map. Boundary sub i is going to go from c sub i to c sub i minus 1. And the, the reason for calling a boundary map is kind of obscured in this way of thinking about it. But if you've done algebraic topology, then it's, it's, it's be familiar to you. And so boundary sub i, I have to, in order to define what this map is, I should define what it is on the generators of this group, because it's a free abelian group. Um, so I boundary sub i of a critical point q. q is a critical point in this i. Is equal to the sum over all critical points p of index i minus one of some number n sub of q of p times of p. This is an integer, and um, I'll uh, so n sub q p. I'll, I'll say this in a slightly fancier way shortly. n sub qp is equal to the signed count of flow lines from q to p. And that reminds me. 
reminds me that there's some extra data I needed to um, include to talk about what signed means. There's an extra data I need to, um, an extra choice I need to make here in this package, which is um, you need to choose arbitrarily orient um, all ascending and descending manifolds. They're just, uh, you know, the ascending and descending manifolds are just disks, right, of various dimensions. Ar uh, don't arbitrarily choose their orientations. Ar choose them so that um, for each critical point, the orientation of, so maybe I should elaborate on this. Um, so that um, at critical point P, remember the ascending and descending manifold for the critical point P intersect transversely at the point P, and I want the descending manifold, you know, it, I want this to line up with how we do the coordinates. So when we do the coordinates, x1 up to xk are the first coordinates, and xk plus 1 up to xn are the next coordinates, right? The first k are the descending ones, the last n minus k are the ascending ones, and so I want those to be, basically I'm just saying, you know, you choose coordinates, that, that gives you orientation basically, right? Um, so that I want the, the descending manifold first, descending manifold for p, dotted with, this is the sine intersection, with the um, ascending manifold for p, I want that to equal plus one. So that just means that they, if I if at that point I take my orientation for the descending manifold, followed by my orientation for the ascending manifold, put those together to an orientation for the whole thing that agrees with the given orientation. So this is closed and oriented. And if if you want to avoid thinking about orientation, you do everything mod two, and then you don't have to worry about any of this. But I want to do it with orientation to show you the, the power of the, the full power. Um, and you know, it, okay. so so at this critical point P, you have this. Um, so this is some choice of orientations for ascending descending manifolds, which is um, I may forget at some point to show that the and the homology we produce in the end does not depend upon those choice of orientations. Um, it's not that hard. In fact. Maybe I'll say now that, I, that I'll, I'll, there are various other. The, the most important thing is to show that we're going to produce some variant in homology, which does not depend upon the choice of the Morse function in the vector field. Uh, it's relative. It's it's easier to show it does not depend upon the orientation. That's that's a little bit quicker. So let me leave that as an exercise, which you can't do until you define everything. That exercise show that the homology you get. <coughs> Oh, and by the way, um, um, few few people have to express the um, very valid uh, point that we should have some more um, time discussing the homework assignment. So we'll, we'll be we'll be gearing up for some, some time soon to uh, talk about exercises. Again. Um, okay, so now the signed count of flow lines is really, what it really is, is um, uh, it's really the intersection in some intermediate level set between, um, so it's this, this really means um, in some uh, f in, choose, choose some y um, between f of the index. Um, I points and F of the minus one points. All right, so in between those love, in between all the you know all the index I points and I minus one points, this is where it helps to assume things are index ordered to begin with. Then um, and then you're really looking at uh, you're really counting n sub Q P, which is really equal to um, descending. The descending manifold, uh, which one do I want to put first? Um, the ascending manifold for P, no, descending manifold for Q, intersected with 
f equals to y. Signed count, signed count and intersections, as in a manifold for P, Remember, so we know that this is going to be a sphere, right? Because it has a, we're coming down, we've got our, our critical point of index, we've got all our index i points, there they are, these are all index i, here's our one points. I think that particular one we're focusing on, Q, a particular P here. We've got this level set Y, F equals to Y. And we know that the descending manifold for Q um, doesn't hit any index, doesn't hit anything before it hits level Y, because the only thing it could hit is one of the other index I critical points, and we know that um, ascending from, you know, ascending, descending are disjoint if they're the same index. Um, and then from P, we come up here, and we have some passive people there, and we have some, here's some count intersection there. And so it's really just a sphere, an oriented sphere intersecting an oriented sphere. Now, again, you, you have to think this is, you know, what, what's your convention for orienting this if you've got an orienta orientation of that? Um, and uh, they can. Let me just slough over that for now. I mean, it, it's, it, you choose. There, there are lots of different places in which you would choose various convent orientation conventions. It's, it's again, I mean, it's, it's the, con, it's, it's, the, there is a standard way to do it, right? That's, that's uh, codimension one? This is. The, the, the FN versus Y? FN versus Y is codimension one of the whole thing. So, right? no, well, the first thing is how do you, how do you orient the FN versus Y? There are two choices. You orient it. As if it's the boundary of the stuff below, or as if it's the boundary of the stuff above. Oh, I see. Okay, that's really the choice you have to decide. And we, I, the convention is to orient it as the boundary of the stuff below. So we orient it so that the upward direction is, um, is, is, is first in your orientation. Um, so upward first. Um, okay. Um, and so this is, I've defined, uh, I've, def I've given, I've defined the boundary map on the generators of this abelian group. So now I just, and then you just extend linearly. Again, I mean, I keep saying, everyone says abelian group because that's really what it is, but I always think of it as vector space over Z, which of course is that terminology. Um, and, uh, oh, you could also, by the way, if you care, you could do it over R or C or anything else. You lose a lot of information if you do it over R, you lose toward it right, in general. Um, so Z is, Z is the richest uh, uh, you know, where you, where you capture the most information. Um, okay, are there any questions on the definition of these groups and these maps? Homomorphisms by definition. Um, and so now the, 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 the first, um, what, what did a motivation that I want to say, which I will not say much more about, is that um, this is Morse's perspective to say that a Morse function gives you a CW complex, which is homotopy equivalent to the manifold. And that CW complex is obtained by just thinking of every descending manifold as a cell. So you've got you've got a point for the index zero critical points, and then your one map, your index one critical points give you one cells. Your descending manifolds is one is a is a interval, which is attached to the zero cells and so on. And if it's ordered, then, then everything works nicely, and, and so you, you get a CW complex. If it's a closed manifold, uh, anyway, it's, it, that, that's all Morse was interested in, was, was the homotopy type of the smooth manifold. And so you get a CW complex, and then if you wait with a CW complex, you can compute cellular homology. And cellular, the boundary, the, the generators are the cells themselves, and the boundary maps are the degrees of, you know, the, 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 this number here, you have a formula just like this, but this number here is the degree of the map from the boundary of the cell to the, the, this other cell when you collapse everything else to the point of your number. And when you work everything out, that you get exactly the same thing. So um, this is actually, this is also the uh, cellular um, chain complex for the associated with the CW complex. 
together for the class. Um, and, but I, I want to do it. So that, so that, by the way, proves that uh, if, if, if all you cared about was that, then it's, I mean, I, I have to show you that this is actually the degree. And I'm not going to do that because I want to do a different perspective. But if, if you show that this is the degree, the degree then you know that the boundary squared is zero, you know the computer homology, and you know that you're actually going to recover the ordinary simplicial homology of the manifold. Um, but I, I want to sort of take a more um, uh, from scratch perspective on it and just show, I want to show directly that boundary squared is zero and then compute the homology of this chain complex. So what, what do we have? We have Cn. Zero. Yeah, this this is this is the this is the Morse snail complex. And then, now, the other motivation that I tried to develop last time is that I want to think of this. Of I want to try to understand some obstruction to simplifying the um, the Morse function. Simplifying meaning eliminating critical points. Okay. So we can eliminate critical points if there's exactly one flow line from one critical point to another. Um, so what might be some obstructions to eliminating critical point? Well, for example, suppose you have a critical point um, with no flow lines coming into it or out of it. Then there's no hope of, at least without doing some other stuff, um, there's no hope of eliminating that critical point. Right? So, um, now, how, how do you try to count things that don't have anything going into or out of it? Well, if it doesn't have any flow lines going out of it, then boundary of it is zero. But it could, in other words, if, if there's no flow lines going out of it, then there's nothing to count here, boundary will be zero. However, there could be a flow line coming into it, right? In which case, it, it wouldn't be interesting. So you want to look at things that have boundary zero but are not boundaries of other things. That's, that's the, the rough idea of why you want to think about the kernel of these boundary maps on the image of these boundary maps. Because you, you want to look for things that might obstruct simplifying things. So you look for things that don't have flow lines going, algebraically don't have flow lines going out and don't have flow lines coming in, very crudely speaking. So that's a motivation for thinking about the kernels on the images. Um, I know that sometimes the first time you see algebraic topology, it seems like Here's this complex, now let's just take kernel mod image and see what we get. But there's, there's actually some sort of actually real intuition for why you can do that. Um, and, but before, you know, if we want to talk about taking the kernel of one of these mod the image of the previous one, we need to know the image of the previous one is in the kernel of this one, which means we need to know the boundary of the boundary is zero. Okay? So now we need to show, I mean, there, there, there are two things we need. First thing we need to show is, um, Boundary squared equals zero, which really means boundary i minus one of boundary i of a critical point Q is equal to zero for all Q for all critical points Q of index uh, i. That's it. So that's the first thing. And once we do that, then we can compute the homology. The other thing we need to know is that, and that's all kind of a worthless exercise unless <coughs> the homology we compute, the kernels mod images, ends up producing a list of abelian groups, which is independent of the choice of the function and the gradient line vector. And that'll be that we won't touch today. I, I mentioned briefly on Friday why that's true, but and we Let's work on boundary squared equals zero kind of carefully. And uh, it's this this is a model that is you'll see a lot in um, many other contexts, fluid theory, um, gauge theory, and so on of, of how we do this. And so I'm, I do it now, I'll do it in kind of a maybe more fancy words way than necessary. 
Um, and so let me, let me outline what I want to do. So the first thing I want to do is I want to define um, the following thing. Um, remember, I, script m sub i i minus 1, i l minus 1, be the, um, the space of Oh, yeah, space of flow lines. Um, so let's see. Space of flow lines from um, index i critical points. Now, as soon as you say space of something, and you start to worry, am I, you know, do I, am I saying being precise about the topology and so on? However, we already know what this thing is. It's a zero-dimensional map. Okay, because we know that there are the we we so the, this is. I mean, I'm going to put another word in here, which which in my opinion doesn't really mean anything except to give us some cultural context, right? The moduli space, right? But you'll hear moduli spaces all the time, especially. On Geometry, you know, it's when you're trying to look at space of all something, and there's some, there should be some. It, what it means is there's some natural topological structure on the set of all these things that is sort of implied by the context. Um, and uh, so, but the point is, we already understand this. So if I look at all the index i critical points and all the index i minus one critical points, we know there's a discrete set of flow lines between them, which are precisely obtained by just looking. At this intermediate level set, some level in between the i's and the i minus ones, you've got all these ascending spheres and all these descending spheres that intersect transversely in points. Okay, so this is actually an oriented zero map. So is this just the ones that are oriented um, from the index i to the index i minus one, or is it flow lines from the index i down to the index i minus one critical points? We don't have any going. I mean, but we have, but we've. I've already assumed that the index i's are above the index i minus ones. Right, but 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 the we we chosen orientations on all the S and Yes, yes, yes. Right? And it's not ne necessarily the case that like so those orientations have to agree with. Like, no, yeah, no. I'm, I'm I'm considering both. That's a, it's an oriented zero manifold. An oriented zero manifold is a collection of points. Each label with a plus or a minus. Okay. okay. So I just wasn't sure what language when you say from yeah. index i. Yeah, no, to that, index that, that, I from, minus one. that from two doesn't mean. That's, it doesn't have to do orientation. Right. It just means that the direction of. I mean, I, I always think of gradient vector fields right. going down, which is also wrong, I guess. But, um, I could just say between connecting, right? Flow lines connecting index i to index i minus one. So this is an oriented zero manifold. Um, and uh, we, you know, we can also think about the. Well, what we want to do is think about m sub i i minus two. But this is going to be trickier. So this, I'm going to say it's the moduli space. And dot dot dot, dot etc. From index i to minus two. But now we're going to have to be. Um, Actually, I claim that this is, in a very natural way, an oriented one manifold. Um, oh, this this is also compact. It's a compact oriented zero manifold, um, which means it's a finite number of um, a finite number of points with pluses and minuses. This is an oriented one manifold. Unfortunately, it's not compact. In general, um, so what what happens is that now we have the idea is here's our here's i critical points, here's our i minus one critical points, here's our i minus two critical points, right? And now, well, if I want to look at flow lines from from 
this point here down to this point there, right? I have to look at the descending manifold here and the ascending manifold here. And first of all, I have to decide who I want to intersect them in this level set or this level set. That's a little bit, well, but if there's a full line that goes all the way, it shouldn't matter, right? So let's say we want to intersect them in this level set. Well, that's great. This thing can come down and maybe intersect nicely. But when we count dimensions, I, I won't, I, I'll trust that you can do the dimension count again. We sort of talked about this at various points. When you count dimensions, um, you'll see that these, these their co-dimensions are such that they intersect in this intermediate level set in a one manifold. But the problem is that one man, th this, this um, descending disk could have a flow line itself that, that ends on a index i minus one critical point, which the way I think of it is sort of, that ends up shredding this descending disk because it's, you know, the, the, here's this nice disk going down, 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 and it hits a critical point and then it flows to either side. So, so you know, looking at it from the top down, if this is Q, we have this disk going out, going down, but then it hits the index i minus one critical point and sort of like there's a slit in it. And now suddenly we don't have a compact sphere intersecting. So we have intersections of possibly non-compact things. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out how to compactify this in a natural way and then understand what the boundary of that compact one manifold is. And I want to, um, so the goal is to show, um, let's let m i, i minus one, i minus two equal, um, uh, so this is going to be any more specific like this. This, this, I'm inventing this notation in an ad hoc way. I think various folks have a different notation for this. Mi, I minus one, I minus two, equal to the space of, um, what I want to do is I want to think about flow lines. I'm going to call these um, uh, broken flow lines. Um, I to I minus 1, to I minus 2. So really what I want to think about is a space of things like this, a flow line that goes from some index I minus 1 critical point, it ends at some I, from I to I minus 1, and then there's another flow line that goes from I minus that same I minus one critical point I minus two critical point. Okay, so this is um, so this will be a broken flow line. It's a uh, um, should I say more about that? Okay. It's not really. I mean, remember these flow lines. Each flow line has an actual um, integral curve for a vector field. Takes are, are infinitely long in time, right? You never actually get to these things. So, um, and the goal is to show that. There is a natural compactification um, in I, I minus two bar of and I, I minus two such that, so this is going to compactify this to a one manifold. Um, so this is still going to be an oriented manifold. I mean, it's not the one-point application, right? It's much better than that, but it's a much more sensitive one. So that's the boundary of this one manifold, m i i minus two r, is precisely equal to m i i minus two. Um, and uh, Let's think a little bit about what this, I mean, what this really is, is this is a subset of the Cartesian product of flow lines from here to here, cross flow lines from here to here, right? And, um, and so that's, that's naturally, in order. It's, it's just those, those flow lines from I to I minus one, followed by those flow lines from I to I minus two that have the same index, I, I, index I minus one critical. So, um, and uh, one, two, a subset of m i, one cross, i, 
two, and then in the sense it'll, it'll be therefore it's an oriented zero manifold. I mean, if I have a plus and a plus, then I call it a plus. If I have a plus and a minus, I call it a minus. I call it a minus and minus, I call it a plus. So this is an oriented as well. And so if I can, so let me. That, that's the setup. What I want to show. Let me tell you why that proves that boundary squared is zero, and then, um, and then try to show this is true. But this is a very, um, this is a kind of construction you'll see a lot in other contexts. Um, so, given this goal, boundary squared equals zero as follows. Well, you compute boundary of boundary of P. I mean, uh, let's put to it space. Precisely the number, you know, I'm counting things that go from Q down to some intermediate point P and then go from P down to some intermediate point R. So N sub QR is precisely um, N sub QR equals the number of broken flow lines. Q and R just have separated index by two, and I'm looking at flow lines that go hit, hit some intermediate point P and then continue. And so all I want to do is now show that each one, this is the sign number, so I just want to show that each broken flow line from Q to R, I, in order to show this is zero, I need to show the sum is equal to zero. So I need to show that each, um, each broken flow line is paired off with another broken flow line. Okay? So I need to show that N sub QR is actually equal to zero. Right? And well, what I'm going to do is, if each if each broken, um, if all of the broken flow lines are obtained, um, that are occur as the boundary of this compact one manifold, right? Then, um, what's the, um, you know, how many? What's the signed count of the endpoints of a compact one manifold? Is always zero. That's the boundary. Um, so, by the classification of oriented one manifolds, I think they are 
circles or intervals, right? Or disjoint unions of those, each, each um, broken fall line due to R is paired with another one of opposite sign. Sign and pair, i.e., as the two endpoints, um, you know, as the two endpoints of a component of this, this compactification. And so, I want to. So, just by demonstrating the existence of this natural compact one manifold, it pairs them off, and, and I'm done. So I'm just so this is what I want to do, is construct this natural compactification. Um, uh, an interesting question to think about, which I, um, which really doesn't, nobody's really sorted out carefully, is um, what this, the natural space, well, the space of flow lines from I to I minus three, for example, is naturally an oriented two manifold, but does, but it's a, again, it's non-compact, and then what is its, um, what is its natural compactification? It should somehow be a two-manifold with boundary and corners, where the boundary is this, is this compactification here, and then the corners are, are these broke, these triple flow lines. But that's just, a, that's a, that's, that's something, I, I know the various people I've talked to, I'm like, why, why doesn't anyone figure this out? It would be useful in various contexts. No one's really sorting that out carefully. How to say that? Um, okay. So, so now I want to try. Any, any questions on this? Now I want to try to um, explain uh, how to get this natural compactification. Um, so, um, let's look to choose some y between the x. Okay. And we're going to look at the we're going to we're going to do all of our intersection counting there. Okay. Um, and so I want to consider a particular let's let's choose. Well, okay. The first thing is that m sub i i minus two obviously decomposes into components where the components are indexed by critical points of index i and critical points of index i minus 2. So given a critical point of index i and a critical point of index i minus 2, you either have no flow line or you have some number of components. Actually, I mean, there may be many components also between those, but you don't, you don't have components involving many different ones. So we're just going to choose, choose uh, q of index i, r of index i minus 2. And we want to understand the, um, if you like, we want to consider m sub i, i minus 2 of q or r somehow. That's, that's just flow lines from q to r. And we want to draw a picture of that before we compactify it. So that's a subset of the whole big thing. do it below the index i minus 1s, so the ascending manifold for r is perfectly healthy, hasn't run right into any difficulties yet. So this is my ascending manifold for index r. Um, and so I wanted, now I've got my descending manifold for the index q, which might have some 
problems. Something like this. Is I want to look at. So the first point to say is that I'm just going to identify that space of flow lines with um, the intersection. So this is just equal to this thing equals the ascending manifold for R inside F inverse of Y. The transverse intersection of that with the descending manifold for um, Q inside of the So that's the no, so um, it equals in the sense that every every point in this intersection is a full line from that universe. So now I want to um, let's remember this ascending manifold for R inside of Y. That is a sphere. That's taking more than the S. Um, let's see, this is index i minus 2. The ascending manifold has the dimension here is n minus i minus 2. This is the dimension of this manifold. It's ascending manifold. And then I want to drop the dimension one more time because I'm in the level set. So uh, minus 1 s to the what is n, n minus i minus 2. Minus one is n minus i plus two minus one, so plus one. And now the uh, descending manifold for p for q intersects the f of y. Well, so the point is now I'm just I'm really looking at some one manifold inside this sphere. So in a sense, I'm going to boil all the problems down to just you know. The intersection is happening in this sphere. I want to draw the picture inside this sphere. Um, and this descending manifold here is going to intersect it. This is a sphere. I've got something. This is going to be minus i minus 1. And of course, you see there, everything's inside of n minus 1 manifold. So this is co dimension i. Uh, this is. Everything. No, no, not i minus i, just i minus 1. This is the descending manifold. Okay. Um, the count code dimensions that should intersect. Uh, they're all intersecting inside f inverse of y, which has dimension one. All right. So now, oh, but but uh, that's 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 false. Minus some points. Okay. Minus so it's this minus. Up here, that's true. It's the sphere. But then down here, it, it loses some points because there are points where it ran in, where it might have run into critical points in the next time as well. Um, so now, we, let, let me, I mean, at some point, we need a, a particular dimensional picture. So let's do an example where, um, let's do an example where, um, let's say, uh, I want to do. I want this to be dimension to be an actual sphere of dimension two. So if I do, f I want n equal to uh, four. So four minus um, uh, what does that mean? Four minus four plus one five minus two. <laughs> I equals three. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I equals three. So this is going to be index three critical point, index two critical point, index one critical point. Okay. Um, so then we can draw the the at a. We can draw a sphere, ordinary round. Um, uh, so this is a sub r intersect with f inverse of y. F inverse of y is is now three dimensional. Okay. And I've got a sphere. Now I've got um, this. I minus one sphere, so so this s n minus i minus one minus two, but also s i minus one is also s two. Okay, so I've got two two spheres intersecting in uh, in, in a three manifold, except that those this is this is now this one's going to be a puncture two sphere. Um, 
so it's a, think of a sphere with, with, uh, with boundary. But the point is, uh, what I also want to draw in here is all of the um, descending manifolds for, manifold for all the index I raise 100 points as well. So um, before I draw what this might look like, I want to think about um, the, the, the index I minus one critical points. So their descending manifolds are going to be what? What kinds of spheres inside here? What are, their, what are the descending manifolds of these guys going to be in here? S1. S1, right? I minus one, I is three, I minus one is two, minus SI minus one is. As I minus one minus one is S one, so I'm gonna have a bunch of circles right here, right? So, um, so what what are the but those circles are gonna intersect this sphere transversely? So I'm just gonna draw them as parts. I mean, they may go off any direction. Some come through. Is there in a four dimensional? This is right. So these are these are well. I mean, th this intersection is happening in three dimensions. This picture is honestly three dimensional. This is this level set, but the whole thing is four dimensional, right? But what is this? This this sphere, right, is the ascending manifold for a four dimensional one index one critical point. Okay. So remember, in four dimensional index one critical point, you draw, it attaches along two balls, and then there's the as the linking sphere in the middle of that, you know, that uh, um, wormhole, right? So, so those. So those S ones do have to hit. They can't just. They could be disjoint as well. I mean, some of them could just. Sure, hit. but these are actual intersection points. Yes. But like that other one you've drawn, that that oh, oh, bit of arc can't like oh, oh, run what? off into the fourth. Oh, uh, okay. It, where right. could it go? But it could. This 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 three manifold might not be R three or S three, for example. So it's possible that it comes in here and then inside here there's some topology that allows it to escape. I this see. this S two is not necessarily separated. I see. Okay, so it's possible. I mean, this is a very local picture, right? Yeah. So um, anything can happen inside. There's no necessary inside and outside. There may be some other way to get from the inside to the outside. Right? Um, okay. Now I have um, some. Now, now the, the key thing here is to figure out how can this puncture two sphere come down, and you know, if you think of a puncture two sphere, you just think of it as having points. For Right? But where do those points come from? Those points come from hitting one of these, uh, these critical points of index i minus 1. So where, what happens below that index i minus 1 critical point? They are, you know, they're just, they're, they're punctures, but they are, um, maybe I need a better, I, well, what, what, I, what I claim is that you can sort of see so, so if I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw, just draw a local picture of some sheets of this S2, it might, for example, I claim that it sort of naturally has some boundary on these S1s. Okay, maybe it'll come, and this, this is going to be a place where it intersects. So there might be many points of intersection there. For example, I might have some other um, parts of it come through here. Drawing, particularly if it's a picture that makes sense and I'm running out of time. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm totally out of time. What I what I want to say is that um, you know a punctured a punctured sphere can be compacted by it in two ways. It can be compacted by putting the point back in, or it can be back, compacted by by putting a circle in as a boundary component, right? And what I want to claim is that when you flow this punctured sphere below these critical points of index i minus 1, then the actual closure of that sphere in this manifold is actually a compactification where it's compactified with circle, with, with, with well, in this example, circle boundary components. And those circles are precisely the, um, these descending manifolds. Okay? And, uh, and so you'll see, um, I mean, these are just the intersections. You might see something like this, which might worry you. That that this, this so this this blue now is supposed to be an intersection of this punctured sphere with this ascending sphere. 
And you might worry that this now doesn't look like a one manifold with two boundary points. It looks like it's you know closing up. But the extra thing then is to remember that these are going to come in in different directions. Um, so I want to actually the, the if I want to sort of embed the compactification I, I'm interested in in here, I sort of have to um, blow those little circles up into um, these points, which are where the descending manifold of index i minus one hits this level set. Um, I have things coming in in different directions. I want to think of those as being actually different points in the compactification of this one manifold. Okay. And so I will have a natural way to compactify this one manifold by basically what you want to do is attach to it the, at, the, at the limit, you want to compactify it by putting on this point and the direction in which it comes into it. But I'll try to uh, do that uh, more carefully.